May God's Holy Spirit speak in our hearts and in our minds that we may become filled with God's love. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Who is this strange man standing at the microphone, you may be asking? <clears throat> Quite some years ago, I think a couple, maybe three, um, I was here as an interim and had a delightful time with this really rather wonderful church. It's um, commitment to, oh, I was going to look across at the choir and say very fine music, they seem to have disappeared or relocated themselves. <clears throat> and the people of this church who work so hard to be the presence of God in this place. So it's a pleasure to come back. When you, when you remember something, um, often there may be 20 or 30 things that you're trying to remember, like the names of everybody here. Um, and that's not going to work. And then you walk in and, and you see the, the, the wonderful white cloth flowing off the cross, which was happening when I was here before. And, and I remember as then the sort of malicious trick by the altar guild to confuse the clergy as they try to find their way to the microphone. <clears throat> but I have seen through your wicked ways. <clears throat> Where we are now in the, in the weeks after Easter, um, we're trying somehow to be alongside the disciples. So we get lots of stuff about the disciples and the Acts of the Apostles. And, and it's worth it's worth taking the time to remember at least um, how completely implausible the resurrection is. If, you, if you've ever, I, it's, I, I did a degree in theology centuries ago and we had a very good, um, very good professor who'd spent a lot of time in the Holy Land and I remember the lecture he gave when it came to the, the stories of the crucifixion. And he went through in some detail what happens to you should you get crucified. I'm not going to tell you all the bits and pieces. It will disturb your sleep. But let us say it is fatal. It is brutal. It is drawn out. And it is a public display of prolonged violence to discourage anybody from doing what this man did. On the cross, you die of suffocation. You can no longer push yourself up with your feet that are nailed on or pull yourself up with the nails that go through your wrists because all the ligaments are torn and the bones are coming out. And eventually, you just cannot manage to get up enough to breathe in. And so, when Jesus breathed his last breath, that was what it was. We have in the Gospels a fairly clear account. But the stories of the resurrection are much more... Um, not disagreeing with each other, but almost as if seen from different angles. And in the course of the next few weeks, I think we'll hear more of the resurrection stories in the gospel readings and in the epistles. There's two sides to the resurrection stories that matter. There's the story that, that people say, I have seen the Lord, I've, I've touched him. Other people say, we ate, we broke bread together. And then, and then somebody not believing actually is invited to put his fingers in the holes and reach his hand into the side where the spear went. And now we're in something else. We're, we're in memories. They're kind of broken, jagged memories of, uh, of a horrific death for the person that everybody loved 
and also a horrific event, a traumatizing event for all the people who were there, the, the family, the disciples, the women that came with them, and perhaps children too, we don't know. But where are we now? Where are we? Because they, they have all gone. Those people have all gone. But we gather together to be here at the cross, to remember the brutality, to remember the stories of transfiguration, of change, of how things look completely different. And we're here to somehow be in awe of what happened. But that's not enough, because that's not what it's about. It's not about remembering something that happened a long time ago. The first clue we get of that is that Jesus kept appearing after his death. His death was not the end. His death was not the point at which he said, well, I've been crucified, I'm done now, I can go home and have some sandwiches. Jesus, or the Holy Spirit more importantly, still has work to do with this event. And that's what this period after the resurrection is about. It's about us listening to the story and being open to it. Again and again, you get, you get people who, who say, well, I just, I just can't believe that. And lovely one with, with this, this, this sense of, unless, unless I put my fingers in the holes in his hand, unless I put my hand in his side, I will not believe that he has come back. That's a really key piece of the scripture. Not to, not to judge someone who had great doubts, not to applaud someone whose great doubts were overcome, but to notice that the work of the Holy Spirit has moved, has moved to focus on the people who were friends and part of the community of Jesus. God in the Holy Spirit is there speaking into the hearts of the disciples and speaking into the heart even of the ones who, who diligently don't get it and, and refuse to accept it because it cannot possibly be true. We, the church gathered here, are, are here because in one way or another, we've decided that there's some truth in this story, there's something about it. There's something about it which is interesting, possibly historical, definitely made a huge difference to society. The, the church exploded and grew rapidly, rapidly in the early years, and the church spread throughout the Roman Empire. Something was vitally important there, but it a story like that doesn't just spread because it's a good story, or it's a weird story, or it's a story that takes some thinking about, or it's a story that promises things. I think the really important work is not of only telling the story, not only of gathering for worship, not only doing good works, but it's allowing something to happen within you. And this is why I think this is the season of the Holy Spirit, because the part of the Trinity, the, the part that one aspect of this mystery of the divine is the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Now, you may think he's gone all Pentecostal on us. <laughs> Quickly get him out. <laughs> but I, I, there's some, the Pentecostals aren't, aren't far off the track and there are many tracks. There's something about the Holy Spirit speaking to you. I want to, I want to diverge for a minute because the best example I've got of this is, is myself in the last couple of years. And I think it must have been shortly after or, or within a year or so after being here. Um, 
I was riding my bike home uh, from, from a church. I, I think not this one. Um, but one of the, the, the bishop had me filling in gaps all over the place. Terrible man. Um, <laughs> so I was cycling back, and I came to a crossroads, which, which I'd gone through not, not very far off. I'd gone through it dozens of times. And I came to the crossroads. There was a car coming, so I put my brakes on the bike. And then the car went, and I thought, I don't know which way to go. I'd suddenly lost my sense of direction. And I had to think extremely carefully and look at the sun <laughs> and try and work out which way was north and south and east and west. And that was the beginning of short-term memory loss or mild cognitive impairment. Um, some wires in my brain or, or whatever is in there went. Now, an awful lot of my brain and my memory is still functioning, but there are bits of it that don't. Um, I never was good at remembering names, so I have no added shame in not remembering all of your names. I give you this as an example, as an aside, because the terrible thing that happened to all the disciples and all the community of people in Jesus' life was they lost something without which they could hardly imagine living. And when this memory loss deepened and kind of got to, it's apparently in a stable place now, but it's infuriating. It's like having a chunk of your history taken away. And, and that's not long, long history, but it's where did I put my pen? What's happening this evening? Um, oh, I seem to have fried eggs twice, or is it three times? And what happens is that you find yourself undermined. Now, there'll be people in this room who know what I'm talking about. They're, they're, you know, Anglicans tend to be on the upper end of the age spectrum and we bring with us all our wisdom and style and, and decay. <laughs> in, in which I'm now in the decay stage. I should have a, a badge that says best before and today's date on it. But when these things happen, when the person you love dies, when a parent grows ill and immobile, and you don't know how to back that person up, and you don't know how to look after the person who through all of your life looked after you. When we don't know what to do, when we don't quite know who we are anymore, when we're not sure of the next step, the next sentence, the next comment, always with a fear, have I told that joke before? and you kind of catch people's eyes to see if they're going to be honest with you or not. The disciples didn't know where they were. A huge piece of their world had been chopped out and removed. And they were lost and they were confused. And it is to them that Jesus came back. And here I want to do something odd. I want to focus our attention not on Jesus coming back, but on the people he came to and what happened to them, because they are like me, and they are like you who have experienced times when something has been taken from you, something that you can't imagine living without, a relationship, a friend, an ability, to suddenly lose the loss of your legs, to suddenly lose your ability to think straight, to suddenly discover you can't remember. The disciples were at a loss, and they'd gather again and again in rooms with doors shut because they were afraid, doors shut because they were confused, doors shut because at least in this little gathering of a dozen or so people, at least we we're all in the same boat, at least we're all together, we're frightened together, we're confused together. This is Jesus. 
This is Jesus, Jesus who can do anything, Jesus who can raise the dead, can heal the sick, can preach wonderful sermons. Jesus, and he's dead. And into that place comes Jesus repeatedly. And he says, peace be with you. Has anybody got a sandwich? I'm dying for a sandwich. But that's Aramaic, so you don't understand what I've just said. <laughs> What are the people thinking? It's, it's, it, I've forgotten the name of the bloke who, who said no, it wasn't. <laughs> so what happens when you've got bad memory? Um, yes, Thomas, Doubting Thomas. Thomas is the only one who hasn't been caught up in this wave of realization and, and mystery of Jesus walking in and being there. And it's towards Thomas I look as I ponder on these readings, because he is the person who, like me, has to do huge work in recovering, and he doesn't want to. The work of dealing with the loss of his leader, his teacher, the one who spoke to him of God, and he's been on his own, and, and it hurts so much that all he can be is angry, or all he can be is depressed or suicidal or, or just not wanting to show up, but he does show up. The resurrection appearances are not stories so much about Jesus as about the disciples, his followers, that community that traveled with him. The focus that I feel is, matters is, is that we look at them because we're like them and we all go through times when our world falls to pieces, when the person we love and depend on suddenly is no longer there for whatever reason. When something catastrophic happens in your life, in your family, in your community, you're like them, gathered behind closed doors, not knowing what to say, not knowing how to proceed, but only able to be together and share the pain of this terrible, awful loss. We, if we are to be faithful followers of Jesus, have to be like the disciples and learn from the disciples here. Because I think it is in the nature of God's love that when we are hurt and when we are broken and when we get lost, that's when the Spirit of God comes to us. The Spirit of God doesn't come to us when everything's going fine. The Spirit of God can, tends to come to us when we're, when we're broken, when we're torn, when we're bleeding in soul, it's then that the Spirit comes and very quietly, without trumpets and without proclamations, somehow, I imagine, sits down next to us with perhaps an arm around your shoulder and says, it's terrible, isn't it? This thing that's happened to you, it's terrible. But you're not alone. You're not alone. God has been where you are now. God has been where you are now. And you might not be able to put into words where you are, but you can feel it. And God who speaks infrequently given the number of words in the Bible. God, without delivering great long comments, sidles up to you and says, I love you. I'm beside you. I can't fix you. I can't roll back the reel of history and stop whatever happened happening to you. Now you have to live with it. 
But look, living with this thing which seems so horrible now may not be so awful. It might heal you, not the pain you feel now, but heal you of the sense of inadequacy you may have carried since you were a child. It may heal you from your feeling that you don't count. It may heal you from your feeling that you don't know how to manage the next five years, 10 years, 20 years. It may heal you from feeling you're not up to it in the way you used to be. You're not as sharp as you used to be. Your hands and arms and legs don't work as well as they used to be. Your memory doesn't work as well. And when you met that nice lady on the street who walked up to you and said, hey, it's so good to see you, and took your hand and talked to you, and she goes off and you think, oh, God, who is she? And I can see now some of you know what I'm talking about here. It's into that space, into that embarrassment, you have a choice. I had about a month and possibly more of lingering fury and anger. I was angry at my brain for breaking down. I was angry that nothing could be done about it. I was particularly angry when I was told by a doctor that I should go on a vegetarian diet, diet never have alcohol. And I said, well, that ain't happening. <laughs> and I was not very gentle with him. God says, you have this choice. You can be angry. You can feel badly done by. You can feel that what has happened to you, whatever it is, and whatever will happen to you that's awful. God says, this has happened. It happened to my son. Something terrible happened to my son. And I needed to speak to those disciples and the women and the men and the children and everybody that backed him up and say, he's, he's dead and it's awful. That's not the end of the story. But because, because the disciples, in, it seems to me in the mind of all the evangelists, the disciples are the people who, who um, had written on their foreheads, not so sharp today. The disciples so frequently seem to miss it. But it's to the disciples in their pain and in their confusion. And when they meet together behind closed doors and they hold hands with each other and they weep and they say, we don't know what to do. This is awful. How can this have happened? It's then that the Holy Spirit comes whiffling into their hearts, into their brokenness. And it's when they're together that they can allow themselves to be clear about the pain that they've been carrying and to hear someone else's story of pain and hear someone else's story of pain. Our solo inclination is to hide that pain, to bottle it down, to be angry at it, to push it aside, to grit your teeth and say, I can go on without it. But in their life, and I would say in ours, the teaching here is that the Spirit of God comes to us when we are most failed, most broken, most in pain, most alone, most unsure, and most doubting. All the armor's gone. And this season, immediately after the whole story of the crucifixion, and then the first intimations of resurrection that come in the readings Sunday by Sunday, God is gently touching their souls healing the wrench in their hearts, the cut in their breath, the pain in their memories. God most frequently speaks to us when things are going badly, when we are in pain, when we are confused, and when we're not sure. There is a great blessing in this period in the story of Jesus, of the disciples, 
and of their confusion and their moments of elation and then the moments when Jesus has disappeared as Jesus so frequently in these stories does, just out the door and gone. And it's as if Jesus is saying, I can't take over your lives for you. I can't make everything better. I can't roll back the clock. But I can be in you. I can be with you. I can be alongside your, you in your pain, in your confusion, in your forgetfulness, in your anger at your own inability to have made it different. All those things. This is when God is able to come closest to us, when we have put away all our cleverness, when, we've been, when we have been robbed of all our abilities, when our safety and our security is most wobbly, which is where the disciples were. This is the time when the Spirit of God comes close. And if you can say to yourself to start with, it's always easier to talk to yourself than to talk to God. Um, you get more quick answers, but they're usually wrong. But it doesn't matter. You can be open to God and say, God, I don't know how this happened to me. I don't know why my memory went on the fritz. I don't know why the car killed my child. I don't know why I got fired from my job, downsized, dismissed, dealt with a superfluous. And in that not knowing, and in that not trying to rationalize, but just staying with that painfulness, that confusion, to pray to God to send the Spirit to you then. Pray to God for the words of Jesus to speak to you out of the passage of scripture that you may have just flicked the Bible open to. And it is important that we do this as a church and as individuals because then we can actually go out into the world and carry the good news of Jesus because we know what it's like to have been hurt, to have been lost, confused in pain, and we have been able to bring that pain in our prayers to Jesus, and not say take it away, and not say fix it, but just say to Jesus, this hurts so much. This is so difficult. Since he died, I don't know what to do. I don't know who I am without my job. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, whatever it is. If you can bring that when it happens, and bring it and just hold it before God and say, this is where I am. It's like the glory days have suddenly ended and all I've got left is confusion and pain. Please hold me. Please help me. Please stay with me this night. There's great wonder and strength and mystery in these days following the resurrection and before we get into Pentecost. And Pentecost is kind of what I'm talking about, but it happened on such a big scale, it's a bit difficult, it's a, it's a bit noisy for me. Because I think the Holy Spirit in my experience is very quiet. Hold on to this sermon. And remember that at the heart of it, the Holy Spirit waits just behind you, just beside you, just nearby, to be there to hold you, to encourage you, to strengthen you, and above all, to make you Christ-like, to be like one who has been hurt and has been destroyed and has come back with a new and different life, not with condemnation, blame, or excuses, but as one who says, come, sit at my table, have a meal with me, be amongst my friends, be one of my friends. Let me live in you and you can live in me.